Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I want to say good morning and good evening because we're transmitting now live and no doubt we have people tying in around the world. Uh, my name is Willie Gaines and I have the opportunity to host our monthly chapel service here at Great School of Theology. I want to welcome everybody to come in. You're in for a very, very special treat today. As a way of getting started, what I'd like to do is just kick us off in prayer. So if you, if you would, would you just bow your heads with me as we pray this morning? Eternal God, our Father, we come to you this morning. We come with uh, an attitude of gratitude, Lord. We want to thank you, and we want to uplift and praise your holy name. We thank you for allowing us to be here today at this point in time. We thank you for allowing us to be here as brothers and sisters where we can come and share and partake of your word. We pray for blessings on our time together. We pray for blessings on our speaker. We pray for blessings on our praise and worship as we come today in the most humble fashion that we know. Father, we want to thank you. We thank you for the ministry of Grace School of Theology, and we thank you for each and every individual that's tying in. These things we're asking in your son Jesus' name. And let us all say amen. amen. As a way of getting started this morning, what we would like to do is just encourage you to just kind of tie in, and we have a, a special guest who is going to lead us in our praise and worship this morning. This is a, a student here at Grace School of Theology, and, and she's a light uh, and a friend to all who meet her. So help me welcome Megan Jurek. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the first song is going to be It Is Well, the, the classic hymn by uh, Horatio Spafford. And then it's going to go into I Surrender All. You'll have the lyrics right here. So please join in. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is Clouds be rolled back 
as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live and I surrender all I surrender all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Good morning again, and uh, good evening around the world, and uh, I'm Dr. Al Letting here at Gray School of Theology. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker for this morning, um, Terry Weaver. And uh, Terry's, uh, we have one thing in common at least, and that is we're both Navy veterans. And Terry was uh, in the military for about 10 years, and he served as a combat medic uh, with the Marines. And uh, he served his tour in Iraq back in 2002 and 2003. And then um, after leaving the military, he went to, uh, he received his Bachelor in Business Administration. But uh, more recently, Terry in 2014 created, uh, co-founded with uh, Will Holder Vell Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit and let me read their simple uh, vision and mission statement to connect and develop veterans, entrepreneurs, and leaders through collaborative learning. And Turi is each one of those things. He's a veteran, he's an entrepreneur, and he's definitely a leader. And uh, in 2018, I, I happened to be, I was privileged to be on the board for a couple of years with, with Bell Institute when it first started. And uh, Terry took a big leap of faith. Uh, in 2018, he uh, decided to leave his position as pastor over at uh, the York Church and uh, step out in faith and just depend on proceeds that would come from different events and so on uh, through Vell Institute. And uh, more recently, though, he also was on, he's on the founding board for a, a new private school that's going to be starting in, in Conroe. 
and uh, we're excited to see that happen. Terry's also been selected. He's a movie star, right? You're a TV star. <laughs> so, but he's uh, in, a, in a, a TV series, Breaking Strongholds, right here. It's being filmed uh, in, in Montgomery. And uh, so we're excited about that for him. Uh, now, Terry, when he, he also wrote his, his book here, The Evolution of a Leader. And as soon as it came out, I was there at the, the signing and the, the big thing we had down there in spring. And uh, all of a sudden, on Facebook, people would show up in all these weird places with a book. You know, they'd be on top of mountains and <laughs> underwater and <laughs> on airplanes and stuff. And so when I went to Nepal, I took the book and I took a picture uh, right there at the airport saying, I'm in Nepal and I, I took the book across around the world, you know. <laughs> now, it's one thing to take the book, it's another thing to read the book, right? <laughs> I remember years ago when I was in Navy, I had my, in my sea bag, my Bible was way down at the bottom of the sea bag. Mm -hmm. It's just because I didn't want to get it all crunched up too much, but in those days, that's what we had to do. But Tori's written a great book about his evolution of a leader and to challenge us to all uh, seek our uh, vision, our dream, and our mission mm -hmm. statement in life. Uh, just not to be mediocre. You know, that's the word I keep seeing in his book. Well, Terry is uh, married to Chelly. She's, she's a great lady, by the way. She's just all involved in everything. Uh, he has four children, Laura, Zen, Presley, and Liam. And uh, he says he's, he's happily married. That's good. <laughs> yeah? yeah? Okay. And uh, so here are the words for, for Terry. He, he's a I got like four things. He's a patriot, because he's a veteran. And we appreciate our veterans. We just celebrated a Veterans Day. He's a husband and a father. He's an entrepreneur and he's a servant leader. Amen. And that's what he's that's that's Terry's life. And so we're so excited to have you come and share your heart with us today. Uh, Terry and I have spent a lot of time together. He helped me. Uh, we're developing a leadership program here at Grace School of Theology, so you came in and helped me do that and we're praying that will happen. But, Terry, thank you so much for taking your time today, and uh, let's welcome him to Gray School. Yeah. I forgot to mention you're, you're a student. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what an honor, especially being introduced by Dr. Al, who spent his whole life in ministry. So thank you for that. That's, that's incredible. I'm the one that's honored to be here. So uh, it feels a little weird being here because I spent my morning um, figuring out how to murder someone. Oh. Yeah. Now, not a real person, but this is somebody in a book that I'm writing. It's a fiction book. And this is a really bad guy. He's kind of like one of those murder for hire henchmen. And I spent this morning working through that scene where we take him out. It was a just kill, but it still feels a little weird being here doing a chapel service after that. <laughs> I didn't know of any other opportunity to use that opening except for here, so thank you. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna start this story back in 2008 and just kinda paint a picture of, of early life for me and kinda walking through some of the challenges that I've been through and, and ultimately um, leading up to today. So 2008, I'd uh, been out of the military for about four years. I lived in San Bernardino, California, and I was going through just a world of hurt. Some of this hurt was from childhood stuff. Some of it was from military stuff. A lot of it, though, was due to my own making. It was my pride and picking up a, a nasty drinking habit after getting out of the military. And it just felt like the world was pressing down on me. Has anybody ever felt that way? Just like the world was, was pressing down on them. And I needed to get out of Dodge. I, I, I'd had enough. Um, I remember calling a buddy of mine who lives here in Texas. His name's Brian. And I told him kind of everything that was going on. And he said, why don't you come out and visit? And I said, well, I don't even have money for a plane ticket. And he said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I got you a ticket. You fly out tomorrow at 10 AM. I wanted to get away so bad that I went that night and slept at the airport so I wouldn't miss that flight. That's how bad life was pressing down on me. So I come to Texas, um, I'm 25, 26, somewhere in there, and I get to know the people a little bit. Uh, I, I was introduced to Texas A&M where I went to school, and I met my wife, Shelly Weaver. Her birthday happens to be today, she turns 40. She's an incredible woman. 
And uh, I made a decision over that week that I was going to move to Texas. So I went home, packed everything up into my little four-door compact car, jumped on the road and headed to Texas. And I got here and I thought that I'd be able to kind of escape some of that stuff. But really, I just moved to a new location. I brought all that baggage and all that pain and all that unaddressed anger and that drinking habit, broken relationships, I brought it all with me and I pretended like everything was okay for a couple years. And I got to a point where I'd had enough. I had tried to fix some of these problems 13 or 14 times and I just knew that I couldn't figure this out on my own. And I was raised in a church and I believed in God, so I tested God. I gave him just a little bit. I slid a little bit over to him and I said, hey, let's, let's see how you do with this. If you can fix this and make it better, then maybe I'll give you more. That was my thinking. Let's try something new out. So I started at attending a church in College Station. It's called Covenant Family Church. And I got introduced to an, a different God that I'd never heard about, never felt, never experienced. And it was a God of grace. And it was a God who chased us and he loved us despite anything we'd ever done. And I was ready for that kind of God. See, I, I'd spent most of my life until I was about 16 and I left home in a religion. And boy, I... Uh, I struggled with religion and I struggled with an irrelevant God. And even saying an irrelevant God is a little bit, it's a little bit painful. But I struggled with religion and an irrelevant God. See, I, I, I knew a God that, that had a yo-yo in his hand and that was his grace. And he slung it down when we, when we asked him for it. But when we did something bad or we thought a different, a, a wrong way or we acted a certain way or didn't do it, he'd whip that yo-yo back into his hand and that was our grace and it was gone and we were, you know, back to square one. That's, that's the view of God that I had. But I was introduced to a new God, a relevant God, somebody who chased us and loved us. And things began to change. But I was still stuck in my pain. And I talk about religion and an irrelevant God and I want to share some figures with you. Um, there are currently 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet, growing every day by about 30 to 40,000, depending on who dies and who's born. And right now, there are roughly 33% of our population is Christian. So th this question of an irrelevant God is really something that we should wrestle with. It's something that I think about, and, and it's ours to figure out us, the body, the Christian, the church. It's us to figure out how do we make our God more relevant? Because we're not, we're not winning the battle right now. We got to come up with new ideas. Um, when I started church up in College Station, I'm going to tell you a story of a young man that I met. His name was Robert Cates. And he could tell that I was wrestling with a lot. Really good guy. I hope he finds this message. I don't know if he knows how much I really care about this person. But I just made a huge mistake in my life. And he was a buddy of mine. I got to know this guy. And he was so Christ-like. I didn't know it at the time. But he was attractive. Like, I wanted to spend time with this person. He was a worship leader at the church. He was just an upstanding guy. He was caring. And one night, I called him up and I said, Robert, can we get together? I, I, I need to talk through some stuff. And he said, yeah, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to the bar, and I want to get a beer. And I said, would you meet me there? And he said, you know, Terry, I, I can't really do that because one of the rules on the worship team is, you know, you can't visit bars, you can't be seen out in bad environments. And then he paused, and he waited for a minute, and then he said, you know what, where are you going, I'll meet you there. And he decided to meet me at a bar. I, w I had already made it up in my mind that I was going to the bar. He wasn't going to change the location. So he shows up and over the course of about two hours, I have six beers and he shares the gospel with me. And what Robert did over those couple hours is he went into a dark place where I was, really dark place, still wrestling with a ton of stuff. And he sat with me where I was and he made room for me in his life. And he helped me through a tough time. And I want to 
I want to turn to a, a passage of scripture, and uh, an experienced teacher would have marked his Bible, but I, I didn't. Um, it's in Matthew uh, 9, Matthew 9, 9 to 13. So let's turn there, and I want to read a, a passage for you. The heading of this, this passage is called Matthew Called, and it says in uh, Matthew 9, verse 9, it says, As Jesus went from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Isn't that beautiful? And I, don't, I, don't, I really don't even like separating saints and sinners. But I do because it's in the Bible. And there is a separation. But the truth is, is we all have mistakes in our life and we all have sin in our life and we wrestle through this stuff. But our example of Christ is Him going and making room at His table for sinners to come and dine with Him despite religion, despite society. And, and my question for us is, is that, is that what it, our life looks like? Is that what the, the current church looks like? Are we making room for the sinners? Are we going into the dark places? These are questions I'm asking myself too. Are we making room for the sinners to come in and dine with us at our table in our life? And I don't know the answer to that. We all have to figure that out for ourselves. It's a personal question. I'm not talking, this isn't a big church question. This is a, a church of the Bible question. That's us, the body, the body of Christ, the hands and feet, the salt and light. So we got to answer that question for ourselves. The only thing that I've figured out how to start chipping away at this 7 billion problem, the 33% problem, is just to do it one person at a time, one center at a time inviting one person to come and dine with you at a time, speaking life into someone's life like Robert did to me when I was down, and all I could think about is running from my pain. There's another beautiful passage in 1 Peter 4.10, and I like to call this um, the great service commandment passage because it teaches us how to serve. It says, each of us was given a special gift, 1 Peter 4.10, and we were given these gifts by the manifold grace of God, and we should be good stewards of them, and we should use them to serve others. And I always point out that it doesn't say if you were given a gift. It says each of you were given a gift, and you should use those gifts to serve others. That's our command. That's our command. Whatever your gift is, if it's healthcare profession, if it's a scholarly position, if it's an admin position, if it's a preaching position, I'm not a preacher. If it's a, it's, if it's a hospitality gift, whatever that gift is, we should be using that to serve others. So oftentimes, uh, I started this um, nonprofit called Vell Institute, and it focuses on leadership, entrepreneurship, and veterans, connecting and developing those groups of people. And I'm often asked to, to speak in front of groups in a business, secular setting. And I think to myself, well, I got an opportunity to go out and speak to a crowd of people anywhere from you know, 10 to 200 people. What am I going to say? How am I going to shine my light in some unique way? How am I going to use my gifts to do that? So I often set up a scenario. And when they ask me to speak, they get all of me. They, they, don't, they, don't, you know, they don't box me in. I, I send them my slides ahead of time. They see what I'm going to talk about. Sometimes I get questioned. Is this going to be appropriate for the audience? And I say, I'll make it appropriate. But you, you're getting all of me. So I oftentimes set up a scenario. And I will present a description of a leader. 
So let me do that here. So let me describe a leader and see if you guys can think about who I'm talking about. This is somebody who believes the world is coming to an end. This is somebody who cares so much, an incredible transcendent leader. He cares so much about his people that he came up with a plan to save them all. And he's warning us. He's warning us the world will come to an end. He's willing to sacrifice everything to save each and every one of you guys. Do you know who I'm talking about? Who? Jesus. No, it's Elon Musk. <laughs> Elon Musk. He, he founded a company called SpaceX. They're creating big rocket ships. They're going to send everybody to Mars. They also created an electric car. They're also digging tunnels underneath the big cities, which will save us from one of our greatest threats, which is traffic. Traffic. <laughs> now you can research that. So he has SpaceX, he has Tesla, he has the Boring Company. He is, he is a transcendent leader who's working on saving everybody. So I've just described this transcendent leader for people. I show a picture of Elon Musk and talk through those point, points. And then I describe another leader. This is a leader who says things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Boy, what a paradoxical idea. This is a leader who says he came to serve and not be served. He never wrote a word. Check this out. He never wrote a word, but he's the subject of the best-selling book of all time. Never wrote a word on paper, but he knelt down with his finger and wrote in the sand. Do you remember what he said when he stood up? Yeah, He had somebody who committed adultery that the Pharisees were persecuting. They were getting ready to stone her. He looked at him and he said, he who's without sin, throw the first stone. He protected sinners, people who needed him. He is the, he's the centerpiece of scripture. And if there was one word to describe this transcendent leader, what would it be? What would one, one word be? Love. Love. Or maybe even grace. It'd be a toss-up. Isn't that incredible? And then I present a picture of Jesus. And I want to I want to just suggest that all we have to do we don't ha we don't have to cram this stuff down people's throat. All we have to do is present the facts. This stuff's recorded in the Bible. All we have to do is present leaders and transcendent leaders and let the people decide. If we can share what Christ has done for us, what Christ has done in our life, how Christ dragged us out of the bars, cleaned us up, turned us into husbands who are, who are worth staying with, fathers who are worth being around. That's what happened in my life. All we have to do is present our story and present the facts and let people decide. But we have to be willing to present the facts. We have to bring it up. It doesn't matter where we're at. It doesn't matter the venue. we got to bring it up. The one thing that we can't do, the one thing that we can't do is delegate our responsibility as the church to the church. We can't say we're going to leave our duty as, as Christ followers, our responsibility. We can't leave that up to the big church, the building and the hired staff and the, and the worship teams. We can't delegate that responsibility to, our, to the big church. We got to take that one by one and chip away at that 7.7 .7 billion people. He's calling us to use our gifts in whatever environment, whether it's here or in the secular world or in a diner with a, with a waitress who's got the world pressing down on her or in a bar or in a bar like my friend Robert did for me and I desperately needed it. So I wanna kinda just wrap this uh, talk up with a story and it's a story of when I was in the military and it's my favorite story to talk about. Some of you have probably heard it we just, we just celebrated Veterans Day, and I think we should change Veterans Day in, into at least Veterans Week or Veterans Month, all in a, something like that. <laughs> but anyway, in honor of Veterans Day, I want to tell you one last story and wrap this up. This took place in uh, 2003. I was just turned 21, and I was waiting at, in northern Kuwait where all the U.S. forces staged to go into Iraq. We were waiting there. 
It was the night before we were going to invade the country with ground forces. And they told us, hey, get some sleep because tomorrow we're going in. And there was no way of getting sleep. Everybody was hopped up on it. There were bombs going off overhead. There was a dream. All the Marines wanted to kill people. All, everybody was scared. It was just a mess. So we laid there all night long and worried about what would happen the next day. And the next day, we entered Iraq and we began heading towards Baghdad, which was the main stronghold. That was the, the, the biggest uh, military stronghold. So we, hit, we were heading towards Baghdad. And after about a day of traveling, we had a, a convoy of vehicles, about uh, 200 vehicles. We got orders from some general somewhere that we were going to park on the side of the road and wait for about three days. Now, I was a low man on the totem pole. I was the medical guy who took care of the Marines. And so I thought to myself, oh, man, this isn't good. We're going to be parked on the side of the road, like sitting ducks for three days. doesn't make any sense. So we park on the side of the road. And I remember about a day and a half, we all start getting antsy. You know, we're in, we're in a war zone. We're ready to, to go after some people. And a friend of mine, his name was HM3 Rezik. He came up to me and he said, hey, Weaver, I got this idea. And as soon as he said that, I knew something bad was coming. <laughs> no. So he said, listen, we're going to be here for another day and a half. And there's a local village that's full of Iraqi women and children. And when people, when the, the U.S. Air Force started dropping bombs, all the people that had money, the, med, the trained medical personnel, they left the country. So they had no medical personnel. He said, let's just me and you jump in our ambulance. We'll sneak over to this nearby village and we'll help some of these people out since we're going to be here anyway. And I thought about it for a minute and I said, this guy wants us to leave all the Marines and all the guns and sneak over and help these people who are technically our enemies. I thought about that for a minute and said, okay, let's go. <laughs> so we jump into the ambulance, we sneak over to this nearby village, and as soon as they see us, they start flocking our vehicle. We had a, a, a Humvee that was outfitted with a big um, fiberglass dome on it that was an ambulance, and there was a red cross on it. So as soon as they saw that, they started flocking towards us. And we begin to triage young women and children and take care of them, pass out medications, and patch them up. And after about 45 minutes, I'll never forget this, I see this blue Nissan pickup truck racing towards us. And all the bad guys drove Nissan pickup trucks, I promise. Uh, there was some kind of bad guy Nissan pickup depot somewhere that <laughs> shelled these things out. Anyway, these guys were racing towards us, and I saw there were two Iraqi men in the, in the uh, cab. And I signaled over to my buddy Rezik. I said, Rezik, get ready because we're going to war, dude. Like, we're, we're going to have to take these guys out. But as they got a little closer, I looked through the windshield, and I could see that they weren't there for any to harm us. In fact, they needed help. They pulled up next to us, and the passenger door opened up. And I remember an older, feeble Iraqi man stepping out of the vehicle, and he hobbled towards us, and he pulled up his pant leg, and he showed us this nasty wound on his leg. And his femur was about the size of my forearm. He had lost a bunch of weight. He had had this wound for like two weeks now, and he was in really bad shape. So we turned our attention to him. We gave him an IV bag, 1,000 milligrams of ANSEF right there in the desert, took all the dead skin off of his wound, uh, gave him some oral antibiotics, and spent about a half an hour patching this guy up. And I remember what happened next will forever stay with me. It marked, marked my life forever. This Iraqi man, after we got done fixing him up, he stepped out of his vehicle and he hobbled towards us and he shook our hand and he hugged us and he thanked us for taking care of him. And for some reason, that, that marked me forever. And I want to suggest that I know why. It's, it's because me and Rezik, we left all of our comfort and security and we decided to go and risk everything and help some people who desperately needed the gifts and talents that we had. And for some reason, my life was marked forever. Who knows if he'll remember that? I don't know. But it was an incredible example of, of, of us benefiting from serving others. I think that's the key to life. So just wrapping up, I, I, I just want to uh, leave you with 
using your gifts, whatever they are, whatever gifts God has given you, hone them, perfect them, and use them. Uh, I, I got to write a book. It's, it's this book right here. And I feel kind of bad because it's just biblical principles wrapped up and told stories by some other leaders, and it's just kind of a, a neat deal. Um, and I got to be a part of this TV series. And this TV series is going gonna, is gonna to go out in front of millions of people, and it's going to minister to people who are hurting. I play a detective who's going through a lot of stuff, and uh, he's going to minister to his children eventually. It's going to be an incredible opportunity. And um, use whatever gifts you have, whatever you can. To, to serve others and, and get his message up to us. It's not up to the big building uh, full of people that assemble Sunday. It's up to us. So uh, finally, I just want to thank Grace, and I specifically want to speak to the donors and the students of Grace who can't be here. And I want to let you know that everyone that I've met from Grace, the, 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 from the president to the person who works at the front desk, they're all such humble leaders. They care so much. They're so generous. And I am so proud to be a part of this school. And, and uh, I just want to let you know their character. And then thank you for watching and, and being here with me. That's all I got. Wow. Um, powerful. Uh, thank you for such an encouraging message and in many ways for a very convicting message. Uh, that was outstanding. And so uh, we want to close out today. We want to thank you guys for tying in. We thank you around the world for tying in and really taking to heart what it is that Terry has shared with us today. Uh, I'm sure it touched many of you uh, in the manner in which it touched me. So. Um, this may be our final chapel service of the year. As we are approaching the holiday season here in the U.S., uh, we have a time of Thanksgiving. And it's, it's uh, filled with a bunch of overeating <laughs> and gluttony. Uh, but it's also a time when family and friends get together. And it's a time where we can all be thankful, uh, not for just the food, but for the sacrifice that has been made for each and every one of us. And so we want to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving season. And as we approach the uh, season where we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we want to ask you to be mindful of others as well during that particular point in time. We have a lot to be thankful for. Um, what I'd like to do at the end is kind of close out in a prayer, but I'm going to do something a little bit different. Terry, would you come up and close us out in a prayer. It's just so impactful. Okay. Okay. Father God, we love you and uh, we just honor you, God, and we bow before you humbly and just thank you for, for everything that you've, um, you've given us, Father, from our, from our freedom to the gifts you've, you've enabled us with, God, to the, the people whose heart long to serve you, God. And we thank you that you're a respecter of no person, God, that you respect uh, the sinners and the saints alike, God, and that your heart breaks for those who desperately need you, Father. And we just pray that uh, today you'd give us um, boldness to speak out in your name, Father, to carry this message of, of the sacrifice you've made, Father, that, you, that you'd teach us, that you'd lead us by your Spirit on how you want us to use these gifts, Father, and that you'd reward us, Father. We know that you're a rewarder of your people. And uh, we thank you for all this, especially we thank you for your son, especially in this season, Father, that you would give him to us, God. We pray this all in your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.